Hello there. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what I've called the dynamics and problems of reconciliation. A little bit of uh, dark humor to start with. Uh, when I was putting this slide together, this title slide, I got a warning from the friendly uh, robots in um, PowerPoint that my slide may be difficult to read. So if you have difficulty making out the theorems and stratagems on the slide, you're as one with, with PowerPoint. Okay, um, reconciliation. A form of reconciliation happens in every conflict and the reconciliation in Central America that I was a party to was successful because it was a successful peace process. Does it mean that everybody was reconciled? No, it doesn't. But it does mean on the balance of probabilities, most people were partially or fully reconciled. Uh, I would say about the former Yugoslavia and particularly Bosnia, that reconciliation has failed. The Dayton process was a deeply flawed process. And that to this day, 20 something years later, we do not have a reconciled properly reconciled population. Um, when I think about East Timor, East Timor was possibly even more successful than Central America. Um, those who had caused the damage, the autonomists, were divided into three categories by the Timorese. People with clean hands who could come back tomorrow and be reconciled, there was no problem. People with dirty hands, they'd stolen something or broken something or set fire to something. They had to make restitution. They had to face a village meeting all day when people would stand up, harangue them and criticize them. And by the end of the meeting, it was understood what reparations they had to make. No two villages, no two people were the same, but that was what that village felt about that person coming back. And once that was decided, there was reconciliation with that guy. It's a fact. Who couldn't come back were people with bloody hands. They had no way of dealing with that except through a blood feud. If you've taken blood in my family, I must take blood in yours. It was extremely difficult. I settled that as a provincial governor. When I heard somebody was wanting to come back, I would send the UN civil police to the village and say, X wants to come back. What's the story? And if they got the smell of a blood feud, I would send a message back through the, search, the channels that they had sent the message saying they wanted to come back and saying, the village believes you to have blood on your hands. I have neither the facilities nor the interest to protect you. I suggest you find another island and change your name and start life again somewhere else. This was not well received in various uh, headquarters or various international organizations who deal with that sort of thing, but it is what I did because it was my only practical solution. I had neither the facilities nor the interest to protect them. So with the exception of that, the, um, the Timorese reconciliation went well. Um, I'd like to show you now a map of uh, Bosnia. Um, and this shows where the major killings happened, whether in terms of the camps. Um, you see on the left-hand side of the map, 5,200 in Priador, a dreadful um, situation. This was the early uh, newspaper reports came out about Priador and the Omaska camp. And um, this was uh, what shocked the world, really, that such dreadful things could happen. But if you look at the right-hand side, you'll see that total together, the Drina Valley and Eastern Bosnia were even worse than Priador. Now, Garajde is somewhere between where it says 3,000 in Visegrad, just south of Visegrad is the town of Garajde. It's on the Drina River, about oh, 15 kilometers south of uh, Visegrad. And just north of Visegrad, you'll see a town called Srebrenica with 8,372. Um, Srebrenica still sticks in the throat as the horror of the war in Bosnia. So being... Um, the civil affairs officer in garage they had all sorts of historic and actual issues with it this next slide is a photograph and this is one of the ones that was taken at the turnpolje 
camp. It's famous. It was in, well, this one is from the UK Guardian. Look at the state of those guys. Look how they've been treated and they're still alive. Over, over time in that camp, packets of them were executed and dumped. And now for a really personal story, because I want to show you in this next slide. These are forensic pathologists, and these people are collecting evidence for the Hague Tribunal and also to be able to tell the next of kin, we have absolute confirmation that your husband, father, brother, uncle, cousin, whatever, did die at whichever camp it was. So, um, in the early noughties from 2002 to 2006, I was deputy high representative for the northwest corner of Bosnia, primarily a Serb region, but also with Muslims in the Bihać region and, uh, and um, Croats in the region of Durva. So I had all three ethnicities represented in my region. And I became involved, as always, with the prisoner body thing, which included this issue of forensic um, investigation. Now, this is from an administrative facilitative point of view, not for any knowledge of, of forensics. I'm no scientist, and this was very much a job for scientists. So uh, I had made um, an acquaintance of one of the pathologists working in the um, lab at Visico. Now, was this a scientific, beautiful lab? Uh, this one actually is a, a scientific lab, but in Visico, they had a scientific corner um, put together in an old meat packing plant which had large refrigerators because if you've got to store 15 20 bodies at a time you need large refrigerators and I dropped by one day because I had arranged an appointment and I talked to the pathologist and, and I said you know what's all going on and um, she said would you like to come in we're actually doing some work on a body today and I said, sure. And so I put a gown on and, and mask and, and gloves. And I went into the area, just like this area, where a body was on the table, at least three quarters of a body. The excavation of the bodies had been done with a JCB digger. And so some of the bodies had lost a leg here or an arm there, something like that. Um, and this body was on the table. And they had got to the point where they were looking in the pockets of the pants that trousers that he was wearing and in one of the pockets I think it was the right pocket there was a little scrumpled up piece of paper and with careful tweezers and whatever it was unfolded to about this size and it was a letter written by this guy to his wife just before he died and I was one of the first to read that letter after years of it being in, in the pocket in the ground. And this guy said to his wife, he loved her, he was sorry things have been difficult recently, but what with the war and everything, um, he hoped that she would understand that uh, he was not a bad man and that he still loved her. And then he said that he owed the guy at the local garage some money for fixing the car before the war had started. And could she please make sure that he got paid and that uh, there was one other thing about payment, which I believe was to his, his cousin, that he had promised uh, some money and, and the money had been put aside and, and whatever. In other words, he was tidying up his time. And then in almost chilling style, it said, I think they're coming for me. I love you. And he squished up the paper and he put it in his pocket because we found it. And that's forensic investigation. There's no big analysis of the conflict. It's human being to human being. And 101,000 people died in, as far as we've been able to add it up pretty accurately as far as we've been able to 
to ascertain during the war in Bosnia-Herzegovina. 101,000 people, four and a half million lived there to start with, two and a half million ran away, 100,000 dead. And each one of them had a story like that, but not all of them, in fact, very few of them got their story told because forensic examination doesn't happen for everybody. And that poor wife did eventually get that letter. Whether it brought her any comfort or not, I do not know. Because after a while, you don't follow up on these things. If they come to you, if they're brought to you, you do what you can. But you don't actually volunteer to follow up on them because it's just too difficult. Okay. This now is a photograph taken outside the um, big mining company headquarters in Priador that ran the iron ore mine there. And it was, after the war, bought up by a large international conglomerate uh, because the iron ore was still in the ground. And we had a situation where survivors of, of, of the victims of those camps like Trinpolje and Omaska, they wanted some kind of commemoration. And so the company said, look, uh, whatever you want, we'll build a plaque, we'll build a little thing, we'll have a room dedicated to, or a little building dedicated to a sort of museum of artifacts and whatever. And they, you know, they were pushed by the survivors. We helped the survivors push. Um, and things were going. It was very difficult. The reconciliation between the Muslims and the Serbs there was extremely difficult, but locally they managed to do it. And gradually, as news spread out to the diaspora, that the local Muslims were prepared to come back and reconcile with the local Serbs who had done the killing and who maintained control of the local authority of that region as a result of the Dayton process, but they were prepared to reconcile. And messages were sent by the diaspora, particularly some of the diaspora in the United Kingdom, to the company that they would organize uh, newspapers and, and boycotts and complaints about the company for, they, for their subsidizing of ethnic cleansing. Now, let us be absolutely clear. I don't think the company had humanitarian uh, instincts. They were happy to have a small commemorative museum and, 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 and markers on their territory in order to, as a gesture to the local community. The locals wanted it. The diaspora didn't want it. The diaspora wanted to stop any effort at reconciliation, no matter how painful that reconciliation was. And this is the issue and the dynamics of reconciliation. The least reconcilable are the diasporas everywhere. Think about it. Whatever conflict you're talking about, those who ran away to another place, whether it's through guilt that they ran away, are the most vociferous, are the most difficult to deal with. The people who stayed and who have the most poignant and heart-wrenching stories to tell are often the ones who can eventually, eventually reach some kind of reconciliation. But the diaspora, appalling people appalling people and they ran away they were safe so we go on to the final observations that i have and that of course is the kenevin framework um so in the obvious domain it's really quite simple without reconciliation the war never really stops as we know now with the uh forever bubbling Serb separatism in Bosnia. The war never really stops, even though the, the shooting may stop, but the anger and the acrimony and the lies and the propaganda never stop. Um, people's history projects, I'm a great believer in them. You talk about truth commissions and amnesties. That is not the primary thing that is needed. What is needed is for people to know their story has been heard. And this is true, actually, of any of you. If any of you are older and know that your time is ending, you would like to do a life review. And you go through your life. In the old days, you wrote a memoir, maybe. Or you do a 
podcast nowadays or whatever, but you start at the beginning and you work your way through and you just want a few people to hear it. You don't need people analyzing it. You don't need people judging it. You want people to hear it. And I believe that there is a visceral need for people's histories in situations like this, for the story to be told. Yes, if there is international law has been broken, and yes, if the international community can put up the resources for a tribunal to, to apportion criminal blame, all for it. But the basic start point is a people's history. Interestingly, although money was found for a people's history, people in The Hague Tribunal stopped it. They didn't want waters being muddied by a history. Very, very unfortunate decision on their part. Um, I've talked about the diaspora. I don't want to go on about them anymore in the, the uh, process. It's simple to say that you can't, you can't ignore them. You probably can't live with them and you can't live without their influence. I have no um, advice on that. My, and the reason why I'm so down on them is whenever, in whichever context I've come across diaspora influence coming back in, it is always, at the least, it is unhelpful, but at the worst, it's positively malign. And that's just the way things are. That's, that's human nature. I don't know how to, to help them. Um, I do know that those who actually went through it often benefit, as I say, to a small extent from a people's history. Does it bring back your dead loved ones? No, it doesn't. But someone has heard your story. They listened to your story. And that is a small measure of relief in a large amount of pain. But it does, it does help and it should be done whenever possible. And that, really, without becoming more maudlin, is, is all I really want to say about, uh, about that um, process.